To the watchful eye, it is impossible to ignore the influences our collective past has had on the modern world. Although it may not be something tangible, the effects of that past, whether it be at the inclination of man or of greater historical trends and forces, can be observed in countless aspects of modern society on a macro and microscopic level. In regards to the power of the individual in shaping the history of not only a nation, but the world, there is perhaps no greater example than Russia's Ivan IV, otherwise known as Ivan the Terrible, a highly tragic but also despotic and controversial figure in Russian and greater human history. Although most infamous for murdering his son and heir in a fit of rage, an act that would have far-reaching consequences, the true extent of the repercussions of the reign of Ivan the Terrible is often overlooked. In fact, his legacy has cemented itself as a dominant force in Russian history that has directly led to centuries of autocracy and oppression, but also times of great economic prosperity and political power and influence. Ivan was born the son of Grand Prince Vasily III of Muscovy and Elena Glinskaya on August 25, 1530. Neither of his parents would live to see him grow past childhood, as his father died when he was three and his mother when he was eight. Upon his father's death in 1533, Ivan was crowned as Grand Prince of Moscow. His mother would die during her term as his regent in 1538, potentially due to poisoning at the hands of Russia's aristocrat houses, known as the Boyars. This opened up a power vacuum for Ivan's regency and brought about nearly a decade of civil strife between the Boyar factions over who was to act as Ivan's regent when the dynasty was weak and without a capable ruler. During this time, the Rorik dynasty was nearly brought to its knees. For Ivan, a childhood of neglect and a profound lack of proper guardianship forced him to rely on himself for nearly all of the basic needs that he was ostensibly provided with. Concurrently as Ivan developed in near total isolation, his regency was continuously passed around between the various boyar houses during their seemingly endless blood feuds over the vulnerable Muscovite throne. Such a power vacuum was perhaps only made possible by the youth of Ivan, and ultimately the Boyer houses failed to bring down the incapacitated Rorik dynasty. Throughout his minority, Ivan developed a passionate hatred for the Boyars, who nearly destroyed the monarchy with their murderous strife and relentless efforts to undermine the legitimacy of the Rorik dynasty. Ivan often turned to literature as a consulist for his miserable conditions of living, and he developed a great appreciation for it over the course of his childhood. Ivan's natural intelligence and aptitude for literature and music were two major factors that influenced his character, fostering his knowledge and understanding of the world he believed he was destined to leverage from an early age. Despite this, his troubled childhood as a result of neglect and isolation led him to develop a rather erratic personality. His emotions were something that he often struggled to control. This would prove itself to be somewhat inadvertently beneficial, but also gravely dangerous. Ivan IV, Grand Prince of Moscow, was crowned Tsar and Grand Prince of all of Russia on January 16, 1547, a title that worked to establish a more unified Russian state, and also one that linked the heritage of this more centralized state to the famed Kievan Rus, over which Ivan's ancestors governed. Upon his ascension to the throne, Ivan sought to make his mark on the nation in which he felt he was appointed by God to lead, and also vowed to forever break the power of the boyar houses that had nearly torn apart his state in his youth. He instituted vast, sweeping reforms in nearly all aspects of the Russian state, including its law, political structure, religious policy, class structure, and judicial system, among other things. These early reforms worked quickly to modernize Russia, and for the time being, laid doubts about Ivan's competence as a leader to rest. Ivan quickly grew popular amongst the general population and the upper class through these reforms, and also began a process that would slowly chip away at the power of the aristocracy until they were but a shadow of what they once were. At the onset of Ivan's reign, the geopolitical standing of Russia in regards to the rest of Europe was somewhat unique. It was well before the time of the likes of Peter the Great, who was infatuated with the West and sought to westernize Russia, but it was also post-Byzantine, meaning that a large portion of its culture and political, legal, and judicial structure paralleled that of the Byzantines. Russian ties to the Byzantines were largely the result of the marriage of Ivan's grandfather to the niece of the last Byzantine emperor in 1472. In a similar manner as the late Byzantines, Russians began to see themselves as a bulwark of Christianity against the Islamic and largely nomadic Near East. They were also somewhat politically isolated from much of the rest of Europe due to the fact that Russia was Eastern Orthodox when most of its immediate European neighbors were either Roman Catholic or Lutheran. In essence, Ivan was a physical embodiment of many of the most prominent cornerstones of Russian culture and worldview, with much of his decision-making in regards to foreign affairs being based on his perception of Russia's place in the world.
As such, a large portion of Ivan's military history involved campaigns against the Islamic Tatars, remnant peoples of the Mongol Empire and later Golden Horde, and initially successful campaigns to annex portions of Livonia in the form of the 25-year-long Livonian War. The war lasted throughout most of his reign and pitted the Russians against the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, the Kingdom of Sweden, and Denmark-Norway. Ivan also played a large part in organizing diplomatic relations and trade with England for the first time in Russian history. Prior to 1560, Ivan had already developed a reputation as a wrathful and somewhat unstable ruler, but he was also known for his fairness in settling domestic controversies and disputes, and also for the positive effects of his numerous reforms. However, as Ivan aged, the trauma of his childhood began to manifest itself in ever-increasingly vile and destructive ways at an increasingly frequent rate. As many would argue, Ivan the Terrible was a man whose legacy is one of unspeakable cruelty, not of positive reform, and it would be remiss to fail to highlight the much more sinister aspects of Ivan's reign. To quote Benson Bobrick, Historians customarily divide Ivan's reign into two parts. The first, good period, extending from his coronation to the death of his first wife Anastasia and the fall of his chosen council, and its bloody, tyrannical sequel. This distinction is taken from some of Ivan's earliest biographers, and even Ivan himself, who all cite Anastasia's death in 1560 as the event that sparked much of Ivan's subsequent cruelty due to, by all accounts, the happy and loving nature of their marriage. However, these elements of his behavior had likely taken root long before, during his formative years in isolation. Ivan's chosen council, established in 1550, was an informal advisory body comprised of officials appointed by Ivan. It had acted as a bridge between the government and various other factions of varying interests, such as the boyars and the church. It had helped to strengthen the monarchy, but also to restrain it. However, the members of the chosen council had fallen out of favor after Anastasia's death and was promptly disbanded by the Tsar, an action that, through the eyes of the law, he had every right to do, but one that left him feeling as if he had overthrown a legitimate government in doing so. By 1557, he had governed under guidance for so long that he began to see any doubt as to the legitimacy of his act of disbanding the council as a psychological assault. He also felt the need to prove the divinity of his lineage, as the legitimacy of the House of Rurik was repudiated by much of the rest of Europe due to the quote, questionable mythology that dignified it, which only served to add on to Ivan's pre-existing paranoia and frantic search for security. Thus, after 1560, Ivan lived in great danger and fear of treason, and at this point, his reign was still far from invincible. The bloody and tyrannical sequel of the first period of Ivan's rule was characterized by a reign of terror so relentlessly cruel that it inspired unequivocal loyalty from nearly the entire Russian population, even including victims of Ivan's cruelty. Before that point was reached, however, Ivan had faced widespread disillusionment from many high-ranking officials in his government in regards to the Livonian War, sparked by the Russian invasion of quote, historic Russian lands in Livonia in 1558. Doubts about the wisdom of Ivan's disbandment of the Chosen Council had lived on through the ecclesiastical hierarchy and the Duma, the Boyer Advisory Council. Members had at times broken with the word of Ivan on his conduct of foreign and domestic affairs. Such acts were, naturally, deemed as treason by the Tsar. Over time, the nobility became aware of how much their dignity and influence had declined under Ivan. Like many other 16th century monarchs, Ivan had allied himself with the rising middle class, who showed an interest in bringing down the old bastions of wealth and privilege in favor of a strong, centralized state. It had been the boyars who suffered from the societal shift, but they ultimately struggled to counter it. During his youth, he had watched as the boyar family struggled for power and influence, and nearly brought down his own dynasty with it. But once enthroned, he began to slowly strip their power from them without much serious opposition due to his brilliance as a statesman and ability to navigate the political landscape. Ivan enjoyed a sort of tyranny over individuals, and felt restricted by ruling jointly with the boyars and church councils. He wanted people at his service that would carry out his will. Slowly, Ivan began to surround himself with sycophants that would obey his every command, with one dissident noting that clergymen began to show too much indulgence to him. Those who publicly criticized the Tsar were imprisoned, tortured, and killed. He also began to drink heavily and exhibited other dangerous behavior. Additionally, Ivan organized assassinations of many of his political rivals. As the 1550s wore on into the 1560s, Ivan was unable to quell mounting domestic dissent as a number of high-ranking officials confronted the Tsar. Alluding to his childhood sadism that has been hitherto unmentioned, one thing that they are alleged to have said in response to his behavior is that no Christian Tsar has the right to treat human beings like animals. 
Ivan seemingly took this to heart, speaking openly at the court of abdicating, while secretly conspiring with his advisors about how to enforce his autocracy through new means. There was but the subtlest hint of the sinister initiative about to plunge the state towards anarchy and dissolution. To prove the true extent of his frustration, Ivan followed through with his threat, abdicating the Russian throne at the end of 1564 and taking out of Moscow with him the funds of the royal treasury and other valuable items from throughout the capital, ushering in a new era of the Russian Tsardom. In 1565, a letter addressed to the Metropolitan of Moscow, St. Philip II, and the Duma was delivered, indicting the whole ecclesiastical and secular establishment for treason, embezzlement, neglect of military service, theft of the sovereign's land during his minority, and other crimes. The church, staffed by boyars, was faulted for intercepting on behalf of Ivan's enemies. Knowing that the people looked up to him as their shield against the rapacity of the nobility, he exempted the merchants and commoners from his anger, shifting the public anger onto the boyars. This was all in spite of him no longer acting as the head of state. Pimian, the Archbishop of Novgorod, in a plea for forgiveness from Ivan in order to prevent a popular uprising against him and his clergy, had this to say. In the past, nations have been conquered and left without rulers that a mighty sovereign should abandon his loyal subjects and his tsardom? Such things are unheard of, and not to be read in books. Let the Tsar proclaim the names of those whom he knows to be traitors, and let him punish them as he likes. Despite his continual aggression against them and a largely successful effort to undermine their power, the Boyars had practically begged Ivan to return to the throne due to his popularity. Mere weeks later, in 1565, Ivan returned to the throne, but the stress of the situation had taken its toll on him. His eyes were glazed, and most of his hair had fallen out by the time he returned to the Kremlin in February. There were a number of changes to the structure of Ivan's government upon his return, but what is most important is that he was now free to persecute anyone for any reason without hindrance. As one can imagine, this becomes very important to his rule very quickly. To staff the new court and administration and to enforce the expropriation of land, Ivan assembled a sort of Praetorian guard. These are Prichniki don black uniforms and enigmatic or morbid insignia and regarded themselves as almost a religious sect with their own rites and customs. Ivan's new court and the territory it ruled was formed as the Oprichnina following Ivan's return. In essence, it was purely an instrument of Ivan's will. It had its own ministries, treasury, councils, and so on and so forth. This would be the vehicle Ivan would use to expropriate land and property from whomever he pleased. The Oprichnina was essentially a state within a state, as the old government was now called the Zimshina. Gradually, the Oprichnina acquired the land of the wealthiest part of the state that comprised the industrial middle around Moscow, most of the north, including Novgorod, and the most prominent trade routes with their respective surrounding towns. This was done by evicting pre-existing estate holders to make room for Ivan's servitors. Over time, Ivan seized vast stretches of territory without consequence. It is said that with land and wealth comes power, and Ivan had all three. In November 1567, Ivan abruptly cancelled a resumed Lithuanian military campaign as a part of the larger Livonian War, when he uncovered a plot that involved some of his advisors coordinating a plan with the Lithuanians to kidnap Ivan and hand him over to the enemy. After his discovery of the plot, Ivan unleashed a reign of terror upon the Russian populace. Each detachment of his Oprishniki was given a list of boyars, doyaki, princes, and leading merchants to kill. There was no explanation for what those on the list had done wrong or justification for why they were doing it. It was simply done. By the late 1560s, Ivan had become obsessed with threats to his personal security. Anyone seen as a threat would be dealt with, regardless of whether there was any merit at all to the claim. To most, there was no discernible goal to these purges. The broad issue that all of these killings were conducted in was treason, but most of it was imaginary. The more Ivan indulged in this repression, the more alienated his subjects became, and the more he relished it. Ultimately, he was confronted with a situation that he could not hope to control. Just as the boyar regimes of his minority had bred crime through example, the conduct of the Oprichniki fostered violence and degraded behavior. Ivan's paranoia and desperate search for security manifested itself in countless ways, but perhaps most infamously in the sack of Novgorod, in which Ivan, suspecting that the city was planning to betray him, sent his Oprichniki into the city to massacre the local population. The Oprichniki, donning their black, indiscriminate uniforms, swept through the streets of the city, laying waste to everything and everyone in their path. Casualty estimates range from 2,000 on the low end to 27,000, and the attack ultimately destroyed Novgorod's previous status as one of the great cities of Russia. As Ruslan Skrinnikov puts it, The sack of Novgorod is the most repulsive episode in the brutal history of the Oprishnina. The cruel, senseless slaughter of innocent people made Oprishnina synonymous with lawlessness and excess. Ivan was once known for settling controversies with the utmost fairness and partiality. 
By 1560, he had been officially sanctioned to disregard the law. Ivan explicitly prevented the Zemshina courts from convicting Oprishniki of any crime. A large portion of the Oprishniki were actually German and Tatar mercenaries, and criminals were also attracted to the organization. While there were many criminals within the ranks of the Oprishniki, ordinary criminals could also dress up as Oprishniki and do whatever they pleased. They could murder, steal, rape with impunity. In time, local action against them became hopeless, and it became impossible to distinguish bandits from the Tsar's own men. In 1568, the church metropolitan Philip publicly embarrassed and challenged Ivan during a ceremony at the Kremlin. Ivan had Philip tried on numerous, mostly feigned, charges and imprisoned. From this point forward, the church would remain silent for years and did not dare to oppose Ivan in any way. Since the beginning of the Livonian War in 1558, the fear of living under Russian rule had grown, and information about the Oprichnina had gotten out. Narrowly avoiding total disaster for the Russian state due to a string of military and political failures during the Livonian War, Ivan disbanded the Oprichnina in 1572, although he kept its spirit intact. Although his personal state was no more, the damage had already been done. Ivan had near total control of his nation, nearly all public dissidents had been disposed of, and any who remained alive did not dare to voice their opinions, and the costly and deadlocked Livonian War continued. Brutal fighting had been ongoing for 22 years by the onset of the 1580s, yet a conclusion had not yet been reached. However, this was soon to change. By 1581, a Polish-Lithuanian offensive into the Russian heartland had penetrated deep. The Russians were, unquestionably, losing the war. With the ascension of a new king to the Polish throne, Stefan Batory, who has been retroactively labeled as a figure of Napoleonic military genius, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth has set its sights on subduing and conquering Russia. With an army of 60,000 men at his disposal, Batory crossed into the Russian frontier in July of 1579 and quickly ravaged the countryside, handing the Russians a string of devastating losses. By July 1581, the situation had grown so dire for Russia that a Russian embassy met in Vilna, the Lithuanian capital, to discuss peace terms. At first, Ivan had agreed to a disfavorable agreement that would cede a large portion of the territory he had conquered in 1558 in Livonia, but one that would still allow him to retain some of his most important possessions in the region. Shortly afterwards, in an act of what can be seen as reckless bravado, he retracted these terms and demanded territory from the Commonwealth, who clearly had the upper hand. In response, the Commonwealth rejected any form of treaty with the Russians and continued their advance into the nation, emerging before the city of Skov on August 25, 1581. The Battle of Skov would prove to be one of the immortal battles of Russian history, and is still remembered in the modern day. Religious fervor invigorated the city's defense, and as an army of 40,000 troops under Stefan Batory assaulted the city, the numerically inferior Russians drove them back and forced a stalemate. Women and children stood with their husbands, fathers, and brothers on the ramparts, piling up stones and pushing them down the walls, sifting lime to throw into the eyes of the enemy, carrying food and munitions or other material back and forth in baskets, aprons, and sacks and repairing breaches made in the ramparts with amazing speed. Despite the miraculous defense of the city by the local population, the Russians were still firmly losing the war. Ultimately, peace with Poland-Lithuania, who Russia had been at war with for 25 years, was signed on January 15, 1582. This time, the Russians had no room to negotiate, and Ivan's drive into Livonia for its rightful Russian lands that had begun so successfully in 1558 ended without a square inch of Livonian soil to his name. The Livonian War officially ended on August 10, 1583, when Russia signed the Truce of Palusa with Sweden. It was a complete and utter failure. After 25 years of near-constant warfare, the western Russian frontier had been absolutely decimated by 1583. Incessant calamity, upheaval, and peasant flight had turned whole provinces into wastelands. The cumulative desolation was almost beyond belief. In the northwest, out of a total of 34,000 settlements listed in land registers of the 1580s, 83% were described as empty. Ivan's relentless warfare had taken its toll on his nation. It had been left in tatters. In 1581, Ivan's son, Ivan Ivanovich, was 27 years old. Thoroughly educated to assume the throne after Ivan's death, he had been bestowed the right to kingship from a young age. Ivan's advice to his son was this. Become familiar with all kinds of affairs. The divine, the priestly, the monastic, the military, the judicial, with all patterns of life in Moscow and elsewhere. 
You have to know how the administrative institutions function here and in other states, and what are the relations between this state and other states. All this you have to know. Then you will not depend on the advice of others, but will give directions to them. By most accounts, his son took this advice to heart. Although Ivan and his son were close, the Tsarevich began to quarrel with his father over his defense of Skov, which he argued his father was being timid in handling by not committing all of his reserves to it. Under the best of circumstances, Ivan could not bear contradiction, but his son's words dug up an old wound, the fear of being labeled a coward. Such a scathing insult enraged Ivan to such an extent that on November 14th, 1581, when he came upon his son's wife in an act of bitterness, he told her that she did not know how to dress, a slight that would have been taken very seriously at the time, and struck her. When Ivan Ivanovich intervened, Ivan's rage took hold. In a swift but brutally efficient act, Ivan raised his iron-tipped staff and drove it into his son's head, ultimately killing him. Ivan could not bear the grief he felt over his action, but there was nothing he could do to reverse it. With this act, Ivan's heir was dead, and only his weak and crippled son Fyodor remained to take the throne upon his death. Tyrants tend towards pitiable declines, and in his last days, Ivan was as bloated and riddled with disease as Henry VIII, and as obsessed with severe self-discipline and abstention from indulgence as Suleiman the Magnificent. Ivan had dealt with a chronic case of ankylosing spondylitis, which had degraded his joints and eventually fused his spine into a single rod. Despite allegations of the insanity of Ivan by some, it seems that he remained lucid and mentally sharp to the end. His death was predicted to be on March 18th, 1584. By March 10th, he was too ill to even discuss state affairs. However, on the 15th, he rallied and appeared to be able to function again. When the 18th came, Ivan read over his will and appeared healthy. This was until the late afternoon where, despite seeming well, he abruptly fainted and fell backward while playing a game of chess. He was immediately found to be, quote, stark dead. As soon as Ivan died, measures to prevent a coup were taken, and shortly after, on June 10, 1584, Ivan's son Fyodor was crowned Tsar. The new Tsar had little in common with Ivan, having been described as simple-minded. Despite this, he was beloved by the people, who preferred to be ruled by a gentle bell ringer manipulated by able advisors than chastised by an arbitrary tyrant who would save their souls through fear. Soon after Fyodor's accession, corrupt officials were dismissed, many taxes cancelled or reduced, due process restored to the law, and the prisons opened. However, the long-term effects of Ivan's rule sent shockwaves throughout the nation, and would continue to be felt throughout the rest of Russia's history into the modern day. Ivan's tormented regime had so troubled the country, and filled it full of grudge and moral hatred that no wise policy in the short term could mend it, nor even a long season of goodwill. Put simply, Fyodor was unfit to rule, something that would ultimately spell disaster for post-Ivan Russia. The Russian time of troubles were still to come where the Swedes would occupy Novgorod, and the Poles would occupy Moscow, temporarily installing a Polish Tsar. Though Ivan was utterly tragic in his self-waged inward struggle concurrently with his struggle against the enemies of his country, he was most deeply tragic as a monarch who came to see his own people as the enemy. Whatever good came out of his reign has largely been overshadowed by the political and societal turmoil that resulted from it. Many have come to see the reign of Ivan Grozny as ultimately having caused much more harm to Russia than good. In the modern age, Ivan the Terrible remains a controversial figure. The effects of his paradoxical and terrifying reign can still be felt in modern Russia and set a brutal precedent of cruelty for centuries of future Russian autocrats, yet he truly remains a figure of high tragedy. In contrast with the more traditional image of Ivan as a figure truly corrupted by evil from the start, it is perhaps more accurate to describe Ivan as a figure of high tragedy, a man shaped and ultimately dictated by the trauma of his childhood. The darker aspects of Ivan's personality came to consume him in the latter half of his life, even as his brilliance continued to shine through his detestable actions. Ivan's moniker, Grozny, roughly translated to the terrible, also represents the attitude of the Russian population towards him at the time of his rule. In regards to him, the terrible more closely describes the awe-inspiring, fear-inspiring, and formidable nature of Ivan through the eyes of the population as opposed to its more literal meaning in English. Perhaps the most prominent way that Ivan's reign shaped Russia far beyond his death is how he pioneered and ingrained the concept of autocracy into Russian government through his attempts to further consolidate power in an already centralized state. Ivan was a firm believer in divine right monarchy, a facet of Russian culture inherited from the defunct Byzantine Empire but not one that is unique to Russia. In naming himself the first Tsar of Russia, he enforced this concept of the Tsar's sworn duty to act as God's deputy. 
Through his preachings against resistance to the will of God's appointed vessel and his continuous action against the boyar houses that had previously worked to balance the power of the monarchy, Ivan was able to ensure their unquestioning obedience to the populace in regards to his actions and the inability of the aristocracy to do anything about it. This does much to explain how he was able to enact seemingly unlimited cruelty upon his subjects with little to no resistance or consequences. He saw himself as an instrument of divine punishment and believed that he was saving the souls of his subjects by punishing them with torture and death. The autocratic ideals of Ivan lived on in Russia, and promoted a political culture that allowed for and even welcomed autocracy within the government. Subsequent leaders in Russia also mimicked Ivan's terror tactics and purges as a means of controlling and culling the populace with little resistance from the people themselves. From Peter the Great to Joseph Stalin, the tactics are the same. They are received the same way, and they mimic those of Ivan Grozny. Although Ivan is responsible for vast Russian territorial expansion, emergence as a global power, the reformation of the Russian Orthodox Church, and the expansion of trade, he is also responsible for the death of countless individuals, bankrupting the state, weakening Russia's geopolitical position, and establishing a concept of autocracy that justified the power and abuses of said power of Russian rulers from the Rorik dynasty, to the Romanovs, to the Bolsheviks, to modern Russia. There is perhaps nothing more paradoxical than the reign of Ivan the Terrible. Cruelty, political maneuvering, expropriation, purges, and despite it all, forgiveness. <laughs>